Praise God. All right, let's quickly open our Bibles to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. And by the help of the Holy Spirit, we started um, this discussion there on, on, on Wednesday and throughout the month of uh, May, uh, our Father and the Lord has been inspired to take us through the journey of priesthood. And we are going to continue by, by way of introduction, you know, to further explain, bring into uh, um, uh, clarity what it means to be a priest and what it means to be a disciple. It's a discipleship more. First um, Peter chapter 2 from verse 5. First Peter chapter 2 from verse 5. Let's quickly go there. First Peter chapter 2 from verse 5. Think. Praise the Lord. That's fine. All right, from verse 6, wherefore it is also contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Scripture says, therefore, to you who believe is precious, verse 6, very quickly here, uh, wherefore it is contained in the scripture, verse 7, verse 7, go to verse 7. We have to be quick, we are doing a lot of Bible reading. Verse 7, DJ. Therefore, to you who believe is precious, but to who is disobedience, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, the stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were appointed. Verse 9 and says, But you were a chosen, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a special people. Another version of the Bible says, A peculiar people, hallelujah, that you may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And by the help of the Spirit, I will be talking about the consecration of a priesthood. The consecration of priesthood. Now, I, I started on Wednesday saying that uh, Apostle Peter, in his wisdom and revelation, the light God has given unto him, was able to bring um, in, uh, to us the, the realities of, of the life of a believer. What a believer is. For example, when you study through the scriptures, you will see where in many cases, uh, scripture refers to a believer or a God follower or the child of God um, as pertaining to him. For example, it will make us to understand, it says, Blessed is he that put his trust in the Lord. It shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He said, like a tree. And the reason why he said that was for you to understand the functions of a tree, and it will make you understand the function of a believer. So many times in the scripture, you will see that a believer is related to a particular type of things. It's for easy understanding. And that was what happened here, that scripture now says, but you have been a chosen generation. Is someone hearing me here? Tell someone a chosen generation. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood. The first thing he said was the fact that you are a lively stone. Hallelujah. And I explained that better, that you are a lively stone, which means you are caught um, in, in direct, you know, um, uh, 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 prescri uh, prescription to the building of God's house. He called you a spiritual house. He called you a holy priesthood, then a royal priesthood. Hallelujah. Is someone following me here? He said you are a royal priesthood, and he, uh, that is the template of a believer. Peter said, when a believer looks at himself, it's true of these things. He said, you are first of all royal. Tell someone I'm royalty. Then secondly, you are a priest unto the Lord. Is someone hearing me here? He said, you are a royal priesthood, which means you have a kingly part of you, and you have a priestly part of you. Tell someone I have a priestly part of me. So, every believer is a priest of the Lord. Is someone hearing me here? That's what Peter was saying. He said, you are royal, you are a holy priesthood, you are royal priesthood. I'm a priest. As a matter of fact, the, the new, I mean, the new um, term for priest is called a saint. That is why we say we are saints. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Another version of the Bible says, all things or all people have become a saint of the Lord. So, a saint is a priest. So, Peter, in his wisdom, said that God has chosen us. He did say that, he did say that God mistakenly appointed. He said, God chose you. Is someone hearing me here? You are chosen of the Lord. This is the understanding that a believer should always have, that I'm chosen of the Lord. 
Amongst many brethren, amongst many people, I am chosen of the Lord. Tell yourself over and over again, when you go through the challenges of life, tell yourself, I am chosen of the Lord. I am chosen for such a time as this. I am chosen to be a solution to my generation. I am chosen. I am not part of the multitude. I am chosen. I am chosen of the Lord. I am a royal priesthood. A holy nation. Hallelujah. A holy nation. Another version of the Bible says that you are a wholesome nation. Separated people. Then another one says you are a peculiar people. The word peculiar is from the Greek word that means that you are a bought, purchased person. You were acquired. <laughs> Someone hear me. No wonder scripture says that he has not given us the spirit of fear to be in bondage again, but he has given us the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba Father, which means that you were purchased. Tell someone I'm purchased. The worth of a Christian life is equal to the blood of Jesus. Is someone hear me here? That is your worth. Your worth is not in your jewelries. Your worth is not in your phones or in your cars. Your worth is in the worth of the blood of Jesus. So scripture says you are a peculiar people. You were acquired. You were bought with a price. Second Corinthians chapter 6. You were bought with a high price for that matter. Hallelujah. You were bought by the blood of Jesus. Tell someone I'm bought by the blood of Jesus. Now, the reason why I'm saying that you should say this over and over again is not just because I want you to confess after me. I need this realization to be in your spirit that I'm bought. If you ever go to a good shop, by the way, and I mean, and you, you paid for an item and you come back and they've sold the item to another person, I mean, you can actually sue them. Because when you have paid for something, nobody's entitled to buy it again. Jesus paid for you in full. Is someone hear me here? You are paid for in full. And what were you paid for with? You were paid for by the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus. So you are blood bought. Hallelujah. Then you are now blood washed. Hallelujah. And finally you are what? You are bloody. Is someone hearing me here? So you were bought by the blood of Jesus. So you are a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Tell someone, I've been called out of darkness. I have no meeting with darkness. I have no friendship with darkness. I have no darkness in my life. Why? Because he has called you out of darkness. Not only into light, but into his marvelous light. Hallelujah. Marvelous light means into his superfluous light. Light that you don't need, but you have it. <laughs> if you have been in a one-bedroom apartment before and you put an allergen, that's marvelous light. That's marvelous light. Even your chair will not have shadow. <laughs> that's marvelous light. He said he has called you out of darkness. Out of darkness. When you wake up early in the morning, you tell yourself, I've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. There is no darkness in me at all. You will look for it, you won't find it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So we have been called into his marvelous light. Hallelujah. Let's quickly go to the book of Exodus chapter 19. We are running very quickly. Exodus chapter 19 from verse 1 to 6. Exodus chapter 19 verse 1 to 6. Woo! Glory be to God. Is someone hearing me here? He said, in the tournament when the children of Israel were gone from the land of Egypt, that same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Now quickly, you have to run very quickly here. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness where the Israelites, Israel came before the mount. Thank you, Jesus. And, mountain, and Moses went unto the Lord and the Lord called him out of the mountain. Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to Egyptians, and I bear them on eagles' wings and brought you unto them. Verse 5. That's where I'm going on verse 6. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my commandment, then you shall be what? A peculiar treasure. Now, the, the, the movement of the Israelites were a, was a typo of the movement of the, uh, of the unbelievers in Christ. So scripture says that they were a peculiar treasure 
unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Listen to me. It means that above anybody, God, 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 God has special hearts for you. He said, unto me, for ye, he said, ye shall be unto me, what? Now that you are a peculiar treasure, the next thing is, you shall be unto me, what? A kingdom of priests. So, everybody seated here today is a priest. Let me quickly borrow your, your imagination. Quick, quickly go to Nollywood. Uh, you go to Anambra State. You will quickly have a picture of what it means to be a priest. Can you quickly picture how a priest is? Or the Ezemo. You know Ezemo? Yes. That is exactly what scripture is saying. It said you have been brought at I uh, peculiar treasure and you have become unto me kingdoms of priests. Revelations, Revelations, very quickly. Oh, no, let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. Very quickly. I want to see, I want to show you how you were made a priest. Now, I'm flying very soon. But I just want to lay this foundation because, I mean, it's the month of May. So, we just need to lay the foundation. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. DJ, if I'm faster than you, I will have to resume your duty. Thank you, Lord. Scripture says, therefore, Jesus also that he might sanctify the people, the word sanctify there means consecrate, set apart, the people what? With his own blood. Hallelujah. Suffered outside the gates. So Jesus separated us as priests with his own blood. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. Very quickly here. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. So that when you get home, you quickly, you know, do all these studies. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. Thank you, Jesus. And from Jesus, who is faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead. And I explained on Wednesday, I said Jesus is called the first begotten of the dead because he's not the only begotten of the dead. Is someone hearing me here? You and I are also begotten from the dead. We have been raised up with Jesus from spiritual death. Tell someone I've been raised up from spiritual death. Hallelujah. So, Jesus was raised up from death. Jesus went to hell. Jesus died. Jesus went to hell and fought the victory in hell. And he rose up from the dead. And that's why I tell anybody that tells you that go to hell, tell the person you have been there before. Because when Jesus went to hell, we were in his lions and we went with him. When he conquered the devil, we were together with him conquering the devil. And when he rose up, we were with him, we rose up with him. If someone hear me here. So anybody can tell you go to her and you feel embarrassed. It is actually a compliment. Because you have been there before. Just that you can't go back there again. You can't be there twice. If someone hear me here. You can't be there twice. Now, scripture says he has been begotten from the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us. Anytime I read this place, I feel like speaking in tongues. Unto him that loved us. And washed us. Tell someone, I've been washed. washed. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood. Jesus, what it took time to wash you. And anything that comes with sin has been washed away with sin. Is someone hearing me here? Anything that comes with iniquity and sin has been washed. He said, unto him that loved us and washed us in his own blood. Not in another person's blood. Michael was not there. He ran away. Gabriel was not there. He took a leave. Praise the Lord. Jesus was the only one that he presented himself. Scripture says the, 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 the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the earth. He washed us in his blood. Now look at what he made us. Hallelujah. Next verse, verse 6. He said, and has made us kings. I'm a king. Woo, I'm a king. When they say God is the king of kings, it doesn't mean that the king of one particular locality or a village. It means that the king of you, king. Because you are a king. You are a king? Yes, you are a king. Talk to yourself, I'm a king. Woo, I'm a king. These are the things that you need to tell yourself. And people say that you are proud. Yes, you, are. you, you have to be proud in these things. You are a king. He said, and he made us, not he's going to make us, not that he's planning to make us. He made you kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. So you and I, I 
I explained all that scripture to show you that I did not just come to a realization that you are a priest. That the Bible actually says that you move from darkness and you were bought at a high price with his blood and you were washed by his blood and now you have been made what? Kings and priests unto God. So every time you, anytime you watch Nollywood and you see the priest, and tell them that that's me also. Because in the realm of the spirit, that is a is you. Yes, and all those things that he carries on his body, you have it. Yes, uh, yes you have it. I'm Hallelujah. I'm a king. Praise the Lord. During the course of, 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 of this month, we'll be telling you of the cowries that you carried. Haya! Kula bashata bahaya. Of the things, of the, of the, amen, amen, you know that thing, you, you carry it. There are certain things that when we stand and when we speak, a priest is speaking. Because you are king and priest unto our God. A priest is a representative of things that pertains to God and his kingdom. You represent things that pertains to God and his kingdom. That is who you are. You are an ambassador of the things that pertains to God. That's who a priest is. So somebody want to ask, Pastor, what is a priest? A priest is a mediator between God and man. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, scripture says, I stand in gap. He said, I look for a man like that to stand in gap so that I, not, that I might not destroy the people. A priest is a mediator. You are the reason why some things are happening on earth, whether good or bad. Yes. Because if only you can stand as a priest over your house, some things will not happen. If only you can stand as a priest over your sector, some things will not happen. Yes, if only we have enough priests, and that is where we are going with this priesthood there. If only we had enough priests, then some things will not be done, and we we'll call it the rigging of election. If only we have enough priests. Even a priest as an architect, a priest as an engineer. That is who you are. This is the reality of who you are. A, a, a mediator between God and man. So you can actually stand between God and man and seek for the, the vengeance upon a man or you seek for mercy upon a man. That's who a priest is. So resume your duty from today for you are a priest. All this running around, meeting one person in white garment, giving you can do, everything is inside of you. <laughs> you know, there were, there were times that, well, when in, in those days, I mean, maybe 25 years ago, when you are going out, you need a wristwatch. Then you need a time clock. Amen. Then you will need to now go and post letter. Amen. You can, you, you, in that day, you need to do 15 things, but all those 15 things are in different areas. But right now, you see, this thing can actually do everything. Some of us don't put on wristwatch today because, I mean, you just press it like this, then you know the time. Is that right? You need to send a mail, then you just send a mail right here. You need to speak to somebody in Kafansha. You just call the person right here. Why? Because everything has now been brought into you. Whatever candle they will give you, the spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord. Yes. You hear me? Whether it's purple candle or it's a red candle, the candle is inside you. You need to lit the candle up yourself. Hallelujah. They give you a substance to eat. Scripture said, now faith is the substance of things over. You are too equipped as a priest to fail in life. You see, the, the, the operations of the things God locked up in a believer, when God opens your eyes to see, then you will realize that these things that we see on the physical, they are not real. It takes the spiritual to control the physical. Is someone hearing me here? So that's where a priest is. A priest's focus is divinity, while his assignment is to humanity. Your focus is divinity. The ideas that you need from God, then you apply it to your sphere of life. You are a priest. You are an engineer. The idea that you need for the next phase of engineering uh, uh, world is locked up in your spirit, then you apply it to humanity. You are a priest. You don't need to hold the mic to be a priest over your family. You don't need to hold the mic. You only need to assume the responsibility that you are a priest. So a priest standing gap between divinity and humanity. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Woo, glory be to God. A priest deals with spiritual things. I've said that before. A priest deals with deity. 
Oh, shaka pala koto lo moko shahaya. Have you ever watched all this is a movie? The reason why I'm using it is because I mean we, we watch it. Amen. Praise the Lord. So follow me. Follow me. If you have ever watched them before, have you ever seen at all? If you have ever seen, it must be a camp up. Ever. If you have ever seen. But have you ever seen an high priest playing football in the hot afternoon in a village? That they, 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 no kings call for them. And when the king is calling, do you see the high priest playing football? You know that it's not serious. Uh, it's not serious. It's not serious. Hallelujah. Because the, the, the assignment of the village is upon the priest in the village. The assignment of your life is upon you. It's on your mirror. So a priest deals with deity. They talk with deity. So you must have the consciousness that your assignment is talking to God. That is who you are. You are an embodiment of different instruments inside you. A priest discourse with deity. As you come this morning, have you discussed with the Lord? Listen to me, whoever you are talking to as God lives inside of you. He lives inside of you. He's not far from you. He lives. So a priest discourse with deity. Every answer that you need is inside of you. Every solution that you need is inside of you. A priest discuss with deity. Lastly, a priest appreciates the intangibles, appreciates the invisibles and the inaudibles. Yes, that's where a priest is. A priest cherish what you cannot see than he only can see. And when we were growing up in those days, there are people who, you know, when they're talking, he said there is an osoin. An osoin is a small, useless god. Amen. That's always behind a red cloth. And you hear this man by the name Fadei, amen. If you are watching me from abroad, I mean, pardon me. Praise the Lord. You can Google him. Then he will begin to discuss. I say, hey, he begin to, hey, hey, hey. Then the people will be asking, Baba, what are you listening to? He said, Don't worry, you are a small kid. Hey, 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 hey. So he begins to talk. Hallelujah. And they are hearing him. Or whoever they are hearing it. Is someone hearing me? Because they appreciate the invisible. A priest appreciates the invisible. Though he's not looking at it, on, he's not looking like it on the outside, but they know that there's something inside that I appreciate more. If I can focus on the invisible, the outside will change to it. Yes, that's a priest. A priest is conscious that there's an invisible hand somewhere. If only I know how to manipulate it and tap into it, I can change my current situation. Listen to me, success is predictable. Only that men are not way, willing, willing to follow the pathway. There's an ancient way to power. There's an ancient way to success that cannot be calculated by the calculators of men. There's an ancient way. There, there's a path that God guarantees that when a man follows this path, the end thereof is success in this kingdom. A priest appreciates. If we had more time in the next service, we, we go into... The, the, the dealings of a priest. Someone hear me here. He appreciates. Oh, so quickly here, let me quickly say the, the requirements of the priest. Now, I, I, I meant mention of one on Wednesday, and today I will take it a bit further. The, the next one I want to say is consecration. A priest cannot be a priest until he's consecrated unto the Lord. Psalm chapter 24, scripture says, Who shall ascend unto the hills of the Lord? Hallelujah. Now, in the Old Testament, the hills of the Lord or the holiest of holies is a place that you get to. It's the third level that you get to. In the, in the, in the tabernacle, it's the third level. Psalm chapter 24. Who shall attend unto the hills of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Which means there is a holy place in the Lord. Listen to me. The Lord is a journey. No man can finish him. It's a journey. It's an endless path. And the more you tread that path, or you tread that path rather, the more you, you, you unveil yourself. Hallelujah. He said, who shall stand in his holy temple? Hallelujah. This is, he's talking about the lifestyle of a priesthood. Next verse, very quickly here. Next verse, next verse. He said, he was clean hands and pure hearts, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity or sworn deceitfully. Here he was breaking down the consecration life of a priest. A priest cannot function well without consecration. 
And by that, mean, by that I mean a believer cannot function well without being consecrated. Consecration is not meant for a selected few. Consecration is for believers. Is someone hear me here? There is something about your life that the world will, will detest. Listen to me. If everybody likes you, there is a problem. If be unbelievers, you know, you know unbelievers, you, you, you know unbelievers. If unbelievers find comfortable to dine with you, uh, there is a problem, and I'm going to show you. There's a problem. Consecration is the separation of oneself from the end. Listen to me. Listen carefully, because this is a very, very serious statement. I'm very, you know, very tricky there. Consecration is the separation of oneself from the enticing lustful affairs of this world to seeking the becoming of Christ for the purpose of usability. I'll come again. Consecration is not separating yourself from the world. God did not ask us to separate ourselves from the world. As a matter of fact, he sent us into the world. You understand what I'm saying? He sent us into the world. So he's not separating yourself from the world. That's what scripture says. You are of this world. He said you are, in, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are not of this world, but you are in the world. Is someone hearing me here? That's a paraphrase here. So God did not say that you separate yourself from the world. You are not. So consecration is the separation of oneself from the enticing lustful affairs of this world. Scripture says, when sinners entice you, consent thou not. I read that scripture one day, one morning, and the Holy Spirit told me, say, read it again. I read it again. Say, read it again. I read it again. I read it like five times. Then he said, you didn't understand. I said, you make me understand. He said, for every point in time in your life, sinners will have something to entice you. Forget it. I don't care what you think you have. Even if you're a billionaire. Someone hear me. There will be something about a sinner's life that you want to, ah! I, I mean, I just want to mention the name of a popular um, athlete. And he, he said this to his interview. He said he was so rich to a point. He just wanted to test what it looks like. And that was the end of his career. If not, that grace showed up at a point in time. You can Google him. <laughs> because at a point in time in your life, with all that you feel that you have achieved, sinners will always have something to entice you. For some at the lower level is money. That's a lower level. When money is not your problem, some other things it will entice you. So, so separation of oneself from the enticing lustful desires of this world. Is someone hearing me here? Are you getting me here? To seeking the becoming of Christ. The purpose of consecration is to seek him to become like him. To behold his face for the purpose of usability. Separation means a distinctive gap between you and someone. That's separation. Distinctive. Who has belt? Belt. A long belt. Belt. Someone should give me belt. A long belt. I want to show you what some of us do. And when I say some of us, sometimes pastor. All right, thank you. So I, 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 I've pictured this message in my mind, so I knew you would be here. My brother, come. Yes, I need him. And I need someone very huge. Somebody very huge. You know, when you're working with Pastor Bolaji, you need, the grace will come upon you to have analogy. It's a grace. As I was planning this, Holy Spirit showed me, said, you, you need a belt. So I need somebody very huge. You, need, you are very huge. If you are proud, you are, no, no. I'm looking at, no, sit down. You are huge. Compared to him, you are huge. But I need someone that if he's slapping, he will fly. Someone like that. Please, 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 let's be quick. Someone like that, someone very big. Someone very big. I will find you. <laughs> In this church, I will find you. At the back. Ushers, please just point to someone. Just point to someone. Or, and there's a, there's a light in complexion, brother, in, in Gritas. Ahead as him. My brother, that's my brother. Yes, seated. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, you can come. I know you very well. Yes, sir. Go, very quickly, very quickly. Ah! Very quick, very quick. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Help me appreciate it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, now, listen, as, as it's coming, Scripture says the life that we live, we now live in, it's that we have been crucified with Christ. 
John, uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. We have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, the life that we now live, we now live by the faith of the Son of Jesus who died for us. Hallelujah. Uh, you see what I'm saying? I got it. I got it. So, separation is a distinctive distance, a gap between two entities. If, if I ask everybody now to give me phones, I mean, give me Samsung and everybody contributes Samsung and somebody gives me iPhone, then I said, separate unto me the iPhone. You will not put the iPhone beside them. You, there will be a distinctive gap. It's on here. That's what separation means. There must be, there must be clear cut distinction. When you are a believer, but you still look like them, it's not clear cut. Did you get what I'm saying here? Yeah. There must be a distinctive gap. Now, I want to show you something to Luke chapter 22, verse 54. This is, this is where we are going. Luke chapter 22, verse 54. Then I'll run this message up. Next, I mean, next service you can continue. Now, now, they took him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. Now, that, that's Jesus. That's Jesus there. They, they, they took Jesus and he was about to be crucified. And they were beating him. I mean, they arrested him. And Peter did what? Followed. But this following is not the kind of following that says that follow me and carry your cross daily. Scripture says this kind of following has another word after it. He said he followed afar off, which means another version of the Bible says he followed from afar. So there are believers, priests there, who are following Jesus, but they follow from afar. This was the, the, the best time Jesus needed Peter. Now, next verse there. Next verse. And I love this one. He said, and when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall, and were sat down together, what the scripture says, and Peter sat down with them. Now listen to me. Jesus' his master was taken. Number one sin was the fact that he followed from afar. Number two was the fact that when the sinners were deliberating the death and rejoicing about the death of Jesus, when they were deliberating, Scripture said that they came to the fire and Peter comfortably sat with them. How funny it is that as, sometimes as believers that we see Jesus being crucified, the template of the Scripture and the tenant of the temple being crucified and the believer finds it comfortable to sit down. An unbeliever accommodates his girlfriend for weeks and a believer feels very, very comfortable to sleep over. This is, this is following Jesus. Am I going to preach in this service? So, because before I touch these things now, praise the Lord. This is following Jesus from afar. I, I know you confess the Lordship of Jesus, but your followership is from afar. So you say, Pastor, nothing is going to happen. I'm just going to be on pajamas. It's going to be on boxers. I, I know nothing will happen. <laughs> By the way, there is no way nothing will not happen. <laughs> Even as a pastor, I can guarantee you, with all the anointing that we have, listen to me, temptation is customized. <laughs> Did you get what I'm saying? Yeah? Temptation is what? It's customized. There are, there are people that you know that you can't be in the same room together for five minutes. Even me as a pastor, I know. Even me, I know. You know, there are some people that when I greet in this church or when I greet outside, I, there's no point getting their number. There's no point. There's no, you know, you know, because you know, you know yourself. And there are some people, if you get their number, if anything happens, if, even if the devil comes in raincoats, nothing will happen. You know, because that's not your, that's not your customized temptation. I don't understand why people will sit down with their, comfort, their temptation comfortably. Amen. Somebody looked like a, your exact wife and said that nothing will move you. But brother, you remove yourself. <laughs> it's on here. This is an example of following Jesus from afar. You are not married, but you are staying together. You follow Jesus, but you follow from afar. Scripture now says, next. He said, do not be, I, I will explain this one later. He said, do not be unequally yoked. I want to show you what it means to be unequally yoked. When I was studying the word unequally yoked, I thought that, you know, just two people going together. But I now discovered that unequally yoked means there are two people that have the same species, but they have different level of strength. So my brother here is big. 
So you need to move together. I want to show you unequally you. And this belt is not big. All right. So this is what it means. Can you help me move this? All right. Can you see? Uh, he is a believer and an unbeliever. So my brother, you go this way. You will go this way. Oh yeah, move. Move. I'm not pushing. Can you see? This is what the Bible means to be unequally yoked. The strength of the unbeliever can draw you because some people are not strong. You said that you are a believer, but I will not take one bottle. I will just take half of the bottle. The, the strength of this guy, you are taking six. There's no way you, you are taking six. Why? Because you are of the same species, but you are not of the same strength. So when the Bible says do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, it knows that you have two different directions. There is no way. Don't play around your temptation. Don't, don't try. If you know you are not faithful with money, you know. He said, I will not take it. It will just be in my account. Don't let it be in your account. Don't let it be in your account. This is the consecration of a believer. The extinct separation from the world. So this man is sat down at the fire. Then something began to happen. Then they began to tell him that, I've seen you before. <laughs> Brother Peter. Quick, quickly go to Matthew chapter 23, chapter, and I'll round up there. Matthew chapter 26, verse 73. 26, 73. A man said, I have seen you before. He said, never. Me, not this man. Never. <laughs> And that's what happens sometimes when an unbeliever sees you and said, I thought you, I thought you pray in tongues. He said, no, not that I don't pray, you know, not that I, I, not, not that I don't pray. You, you begin to deny. I thought that you are a leader in church. How come she's sleeping overnight? Eh, it's not, you know, it, there was, it, it rained, so my house is towards her house. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Right? So you, you are denying. Hallelujah. The second time, the lady came. Another man came and said, I know you. The man said, no, I don't know. This, this was the one that captured, that captured the heart of God. Matthew rendered it very well. He said, after a while, he said, why came unto him, they stood by and said, Peter. They called his name. Did you get what I'm saying here? You see, when unbelievers begin to challenge you that I thought you are a believer, then you know that your consecration life has gone down. When they begin, they are the one telling you that I thought they are fasting in your church and you are eating. Then, you know, I help us of being saved in NLP. That we are, and you are the one, you are the one, you know. Now, this one captured it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. God bless you. Please let me appreciate that. Then, around the this. And they said to him, they said to Peter, surely thou, this one, she, 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 didn't, she didn't miss it. He didn't miss it. He said, he said surely that's one of them. Now, this is his last statement. He said, for thy speech betrays you. You look like a church girl. How come you are here? You can't change it. Your speech betrays you. Know, all of a sudden, somebody is greeting you in club. And instead of you to say fine, he said, I'm blessed. Then, then we know. <laughs> then, then we know. Then we know. How is work? We thank the Lord. Then, then we know. We, we know that your speech betrays you. That you are not supposed to be here. How come you have defiled the altar and you are here? Your speech betrays you. 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 Now look at the situation that you have found yourself so many times. As a king and as a priest, and your speech betrays you. As a believer, your speech, they, they are the one telling you that they are fasting in your church. Your speech betrays you. They are the one telling you that, ah, I thought you were a leader. How come you dress this way? They are not saying, it's because it's hot. Don't, don't, doesn't the person know that it's hot? The person just want to confirm the fact that we know that we are sinners, but for you, we expect something better. We, we just hope that one day you can, you, can, you can step up to your priesthood and tell us what we are doing is bad. Next service, I will show you why people tell you that what you are doing is a cake. Not that it's a cake, it's only that they want somebody to comfort them. 
We want someone to comfort them. Shall we just pray in the Holy Ghost?